welcome today to uh, Red Canary Carbon Black webinar on five ways carbon black response data in Splunk can improve your security. My name is Michael Haig, and I'm here today with Jason Garman from Carbon Black. Uh, Jason, would you like to introduce yourself first? Sir? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'm Jason Garman. I am a principal software architect at Carbon Black. My uh, my official title is a, a lead of the what we call the developer relations group at uh, Carbon Black, and so it's our job at CB uh, in the developer relations group to help folks who are using Carbon Black as a platform. And so uh, this is a perfect example of how you can use CB, um, you know, use the data in CB to power a third-party tool, in this case Splunk, uh, to do correlation searches, to do, to take actions, to do all sorts of good things um, through a single pane of glass. Um, so, so that's me, that's my job here at CB. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> As mentioned, my name is Michael Haig. I am the Director of Advanced Threat Detection Research here at Red Canary. And Red Canary, what we do is we layer on top of carbon black response. We proactively detect threats and help customers respond. Uh, you can think of us as continuous incident response and threat hunting or a full security operations center wrapped around carbon black response itself. At my previous role, I built out a security program and it was within a Fortune 150 organization. What we ended up doing, we deployed Carbon Black Response to roughly 70,000 endpoints and we had three Carbon Black clusters in our environment. And so all of this information was flowing in and we actually put this data within to Splunk. Uh, we built the original app for this in-house and we began to add a lot of new features to it and some of those you'll see here today. Uh, so, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask, and if you've never used the app before, I hope this inspires you and, and gets you interested in checking this thing out. A quick overview, um, pretty generically, we'll jump into the integration setup, and if you read our first blog post on the Red Canary site, you'll see I walked through it pretty thoroughly uh, about the two methods. But then right after that, we'll hop right into some use cases, uh, how we do data analysis in Splunk with the Carbon Black data. We'll set up some alerts and then jump into some of the more interesting things down at the bottom here, the advanced techniques. Great. So I'll talk a little bit about how to get the integration set up. Um, so the first thing, um, there are two pieces uh, to the integration. Uh, there are two uh, apps in the Splunk Base um, website that you will want to install on your Splunk server. Uh, the first is the Splunk TA for Carbon Black, um, and the second is the actual CB response app for Splunk. So those two apps, um, once you get them on your Splunk server, that gets you the code that you need uh, to go ahead and get the integration started. The next step is to configure um, the pushing of data and the pulling of data into Splunk. So we have two different pieces for this integration. And that's because there's two different ways that we want to get data into Splunk, and, and we also have the ability to take actions from within Splunk, too. So the first part is configuring how we're going to get data into Splunk, and, and that's the, the push data on the left-hand side, as you can see. And the things that you get through that are, you know, you get the actual data from CB response pushed into Splunk. These include anything from watch list and feed hits, uh, alert hits, and you can you can tune that knob up and down uh, as much as you want, all the way to if you want to, you know, if you have a, a gigantic Splunk license, you could actually push every single endpoint event, every file modification, every registry modification, every network connection through into Splunk. Um, that's a lot of data, right? Um, and so I don't recommend that people go straight to that. Um, I find that people have like a pretty happy medium and, um, and I'm sure Mike has a lot of opinions on this too. Um, one of the things that I usually recommend to people is you push in feed and alert data uh, and watch list data as well as process hit, uh, pr new process uh, executions network connections and cross-process events, and Mike can probably kind of uh, elaborate a little bit more about what he would suggest, um, but that gives you a, a pretty good bang for the buck in terms of, you know, what kind of data you want to push into Splunk, um, and then what kind of data you want to have ready for indexing on the carbon black response side. And that data is pushed in through a tool called the Event Forwarder. 
And so we have a couple of blog entries on uh, our developer network website that talk about how to set that up. Um, and then the other side of it is the pull or poll side, which is the queries that we expose through an API key. And so those are the two pieces that you'll need to have uh, set up um, in order to get the, uh, the Splunk integration to work. So just to kind of peel back the layers one, one level further, we go to the next slide and we talk a little bit about the, um, we call it the event stream. This is the, the push data model uh, on the left-hand side. And so the event forwarder is on the left. Um, there are two different ways that we can push that data from the event forwarder into Splunk. If you are doing a local or on-premise installation of the event of Carbon Black and Splunk, you can um, you can configure the event forwarder to save the events onto a file, and then those files are then uploaded to Splunk via the Splunk Universal Forwarder. If, on the other hand, you're using, for example, CV in the cloud, um, you can use a built-in S3 output in the event forwarder, uh, which will then use S AWS S3 as an intermediary step. And then on the Splunk side, it can be um, received through the Splunk app for AWS. We have a roadmap item to improve this. Um, we actually are looking at using the HTTP event collector in Splunk as another option to get data into Splunk. Um, so look for that in, in future versions of the event forwarder. Hey, and are you next, finding more people using the file output over the S3 output? You know, I mean, the file output um, is great for people who are, you know, just kind of doing it locally um, and, and have everything in-house. Um, the HTTP event collector will be a very useful thing for folks um, because it will, um, it will be able to power both use cases very easily. Um, and... Uh, and that, that'll be helpful just because then we can eliminate the additional step of either installing the Splunk Universal Forwarder or the Splunk app for AWS. Um, so that, that'll, that'll help out in the, in the future when we get that uh, support up and running. Awesome. And then the second stage is getting the API key set up. Um, and so that's going to allow you to um, uh, do things like take uh, adaptive response actions, which we'll talk about later, as well as pull in data from CV response through targeted queries um, that, you know, maybe you just want to get like a, a very specific subset of information, say about a sensor or about a process or a binary, without having to ingest the entire data set into Splunk. And so that's allowed, that's, um, that's powered through a, a series of custom commands that we provide with the app. And those custom commands pull the authentication tokens from this um, the REST API um, that's taken through the app setup page that you can see here. And once you have all this installed and configured, you'll see that on the next slide with the um, with the default um, dashboard, um, there's several different you know alert and watch list types that get um, that populate that uh, that default dashboard. So. If you see some issues with, you know, like no servers are sending data or you don't see a new binaries observed being populated, um, you can diagnose this by looking at your Splunk configuration and your CB um, event forwarder configuration, make sure that these specific event types are enabled, right? Um, and so that's, you know, that kind of gives you some insight into how the app works under the hood. And all these searches, you know, you can click the little, um, you know, disclosure box, the little search box to figure out, you know, what search types are being used in order to uh, in order to power these uh, these visualizations, just like any other Splunk visualization. Yeah, this dashboard is super cute because <clears throat> if you're if you're dumping all your virus total data out, uh, we had a, we had the point where this dashboard was filled with a couple million events just because of all the VT hits that were coming through. Um, but definitely very high level, and if you have a large environment, it'll get very noisy really quick. And that's it. That's how we can get that, um, that whole thing integrated, and I'll pass it back to Mike for some of the cool advanced use cases and, and techniques. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. That was cool stuff. Hey, at the uh, .com, and we got Splunk 7 coming out, have I haven't even tested it yet or gotten to it, but have you ran across that yet with our with the app here? 
So I haven't tested with seven yet. Um, we, that's one of the things we want to do as a result of .conf. There's a lot of good stuff that came out of there. And in fact, uh, hopefully I saw some of you guys there. We had a, we had a booth for Carbon Black at uh, .conf 2017. And, um, you know, that's actually where I learned about some of the stuff with the HTTP event collector, um, some of the stuff with um, some advanced or some, some new improvements we'll be making to the app um, in terms of setup pages and, and welcome pages and stuff like that. So um, haven't been, a, haven't had a chance to play with seven yet, but, um, but that's on the, that's on the timeline to get, to get done sooner rather than later. Um, there's a bunch of new stuff with the machine learning pieces as well, which sound like they might be really interesting to, uh, to tie into CB response data as well. That's awesome. <clears throat> Very cool. Excellent. So yeah, man, let's, we'll just move on here. So first we're going to jump right into data analysis. And this is probably what everyone's most likely doing within Splunk today, within, if you're using carbon black data, or just using any kind of event log within Splunk. Um, so what I did, I just built a simple pinwheel on the right here, compared it to the scientific method, and I was like, you know, a lot of these are very much the same on how we're all doing something inside of here. Um, you know, we have some standard searching, you're looking for a simple process like net.exe, um, you begin to tune it for your environment, so you focus your detection coverage. You know, you have certain sets of systems that run it with a logon script or a specific parent process daily. Um, so you start to ignore those things. Once you get it tuned enough, right, you begin to alert on it, then your inbox explodes and so you start to like ignore it, or you've investigated a hundred of them and you got nothing out of it. Uh, so you start to tune that alert even more, continue that searching, ignoring things, and it's just a standard process. Very similar to what we see on the left, right? You got a question about a process, you search for it in carbon black, you get your hypothesis. Is this something that you know I need to look into more? Is this a new Casey Smith mm -hmm. bypass that I need to be knowing about or chase down? Um, <laughs> okay there, Jason. What's that? Sorry. Are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you fine. Okay, excellent. Just got a report. Didn't sound good. Um, so yeah, then you keep going here. You test your predictions and you keep going, right? It's very similar to like a threat hunting model. Um, and so I'm just going to run through a few things that I normally always do inside Splunk. I'm looking at new data, um, whether it's some new process that you found on Twitter something that, you know, you want to go back, retrospection, go back in time, look for something that was, you know, someone was talking about a few months ago or whatnot, right? Um, so starting broad, just looking for that net.exe activity happening, start to tune it, you look for command line data, you can start to ignore things. Um, a lot of the time, I would ignore it based on the command line information, um, being that now we have, like, parent data in there, so you can ignore based on parent or even computer name. Some of those things start to help to clear things out when you're searching so much data. Um, and then time to alert on it. So once you get it tuned properly, you can begin to alert. Um, so I have a couple examples that I'll run through. Um, probably everybody sees similar data. Looking at a different, you know, PowerShell obfuscated command here. Um, so you can set up different alerts for PowerShell with a net call, right? Um, down to every time I see dash ENC or download or an HTTP call within PowerShell on the command line data. Um, and like Jason mentioned, some of the most interesting pieces we get is from process and netcon data being put into Splunk. We're able to, with just process data alone, you're gaining user context and you know that it was Bob who executed it, uh, obviously the computer name. Um, you also get the command line data. And those two things alone, the user and the command line data, are probably the most important things you can gather out of this. So similar to this line right here, you see this inside of Splunk. You're able to search against it, look for these certain things. Obviously, it gets very complex, right, when you're looking. If you want to look for all dash W within your PowerShell environment or within your environment for PowerShell, it's very noisy. You can dash C. Um, and if it's obfuscated now, EX, all these weird things, I, right? Um, mixes it up, changes it, everything for you. So now you're just either having to look for all PowerShell data executing in your environment. So a lot of what we put into the app back in the day, and I'll show you guys this in a little bit, 
is we built out most of our detections based on show me all PowerShell data, so that's number three here, show me everything that's executing in my environment, and then we created specific criteria that we would want to alert on right away. And so that's where our EMCs and download and HTTP ones kind of came in. Um, next example is a net execution here. Uh, it's a for loop taking users in a text file and passwords in another text file and running them against a domain controller, IPC dollar here, uh, and it just keeps going and going. And so again, same pattern. You're going to follow your net. You want to have some alerts for net view or net user activity out there. Most likely very noisy, log on scripts. And if your environment's very large, very loud and busy happening out there. Uh, but then you might get some more specific detection capabilities here, uh, things you can alert on right away. So net group, domain administrator, slash domain. Uh, probably more high fidelity than someone running net user. And then, again, we had 70,000 endpoints. Show me all net execution happening on all of my endpoints. I want to know what people are doing out there. Uh, what's normal, what's not normal. And then again, begin to tune that from that little pinwheel. Tune that out and maybe eventually I'll generate some new type of alert looking for something else weird. And then on Mac, um, OSA script here. Uh, this comes from the, the uh, Python empire, not PowerShell empire, so Python empire here. Um, this in particular is there's not a whole lot you can go and generate an alert off on this. So you have a large Mac environment. Generally what I do in Splunk and with the CD information is I'll just look for all OSA script executing in my environment. Um, depending on how large and how many Macs you have, it could be pretty noisy. And so you start to tune it and clear things out and you may eventually get to a place where you can start to see similar kind of patterns like this of OSA script being executed, Apple script here. Um, just kind of depends, right, and how noisy you can get on a Mac. Um, but this is just one example. Uh, and so that is spelled, obviously, incorrectly. If you go look at Empire, it's that way for a reason. <laughs> so, Mike, uh, Python, yeah, something that, that it, like a common theme here, it just seems like uh, a lot of this is attackers living off the land. Is that something that you see a lot of these days? Or, um, you know, like is it less of a a concern about specifically targeted malware or people using a lot of these Py you know, Python, OSA script, uh, PowerShell, stuff that's already on the box to achieve their objectives. Yeah, exactly. So we're you're almost seeing both of these things merging into one, right? We're seeing a lot of malware living off the land, whether it's, you know, when we're spawning a shell, then it's using PowerShell, right? Um, all of this stuff is just starting to culminate. And the way we built it into the app was, from our point of view, it never really mattered if it was malware or an attacker. Whatever happened, happened with the behavior, and we're going to detect it however best we can, right? So if PowerShell was executed by a piece of malware or by a bad guy, it didn't matter. We just wanted to be able to detect it quickly and alert on it and get information out to our business units right away. Cool, awesome. And then the same with Python, right? Um, and I bring this up because Python can be used for evil just like Perl and Ruby and any other language out there today. Um, so very simple, Python-C. Uh, if you look for all Python C within your environment, it may or may not be really noisy. It just depends on what's happening out there. Um, but simple things you can alert on, URL open or HTTP, whatever it may be. Um, generally, just run run it through your environment, see what's happening out there, and whether it's a web server or a developer, you, know, you can begin to tune it and actually focus on looking for something very nefarious that happens. What's your uh, what's your choice of language there, Jason? Um, I'm definitely Python all the way. Uh, but all of our connectors and everything that we do on the CB. Uh, developer relations side is all in Python, except for the event forwarder, which is written in Go for performance reasons. Um, and we keep everything on on GitHub too. So um, everything that we do here at Carbon Black at the developer relations uh, team is at uh, GitHub.com slash Carbon Black. So if you're ever curious how the Splunk app works or how one of our connectors functions, you can always um, grab the code. We we even accept pull requests, um, and, and Mike has been generous enough to share a bunch of his contributions with the Splunk app. He's done a great job 
working with us to improve it. Um, and uh, and so yeah, Python is definitely my my platform of choice just because it's so expressive. Um, and kind of some theme like I kind of riddled here in the last few slides. So if you wanted to write a new detector within Splunk, you know, it generally starts with that question. I want to detect any Office product that's spawning a shell, uh, or I want to review a new bypass, some kind of intelligence you received, saw it on Twitter, coming from Casey or somebody else out there, and you want to be able to go and hunt for this. Um, it's pretty easy. Uh, there's a couple new things that I'll be performing a pull request here soon that Jason will be hopefully approving pretty quickly. Uh, we'll talk about some new macros and lookups that I've added, uh, and then obviously a very simple query that you could run as well. So you want to write that new detector? This tweet went out on September 25th for PCALUA.exe, um, executing that LNK file, which could maybe house a lot of different things. Who knows? Um, and so generically here at the top, I'm just throwing a couple ideas out there. So this is our CV macro. Uh, so within the app, this macro will do everything. It'll look up that uh, source type for you. You have to keep typing out uh, a bit nine carbon black JSON each time. Um, and then I have some new lookups that I'll talk about in a bit. So this, in this case, this is just looking for all Windows browsers and show me by process. Um, next line here is looking for that parent path of browsers, and that's again another section of macro. Uh, so the parent path, all these browsers, and Office binary. So looking for any Office binary that comes out of that. Uh, and then of course you want to look for this new PCA Lua, just standard. Show me all PCA Lua in my environment. <clears throat> that's where you're going to start, right? You want to do that prod search. Show me everything in my environment. Is this even executing? Uh, or has it ever executed? Maybe I saw this before anybody saw it, right? Um, so now you're able to retrospect and, and go back and see what happened. And then what I'm going to be adding very soon, um, this is what's new. And so more or less, I, uh, I actually revamped all of our saved searches here, and I renamed every single one of them. I broke them into categories, hunt and alert. So the hunt ones are very basic. It's going to be pretty much a show me everything that's happening. Um, and then down to the alert ones, which will be more specific. So out of the box, you download the app, you want to know and or alert on things tomorrow, uh, the alert ones are ready to go. So these are very specific bits admins. Bits admin performing a download, you can set that to alert. And if it happens, the download comes to bits admin you'll get an alert for it. Um, and down the list, PowerShell, and the hunt for PowerShell download, um, encoded commands, and then I have a specific one just for alerting for encoded commands. Um, obviously, you'll want to tune that for your environment because that'll get pretty noisy if, if you have a lot of encoded happening. Um, but you can kind of see the pattern here. Um, macros, this is probably the biggest ad I dropped in here. And so, these are the different macros I'm adding now, and you'll see these come through Jason very shortly. Um, but specifically, looking for common Windows executables. I have Office binaries in here with some basic ones for LSX, uh, obviously other Windows ones, Windows browsers, and Windows shell. So now, as opposed to having to go and run through these long queries that you have to generate, I just made it a macro. It's kind of getting tired of writing it out, like, hey, I'm looking for all the browsers and type 30 of them in, so I just made this easy. Similarly, I added a bunch of lookups, and I'll show you the lookups towards the end here, and total different use case. I actually didn't think I was going to go that route, but I think I really like the idea of it. Um, and then I have two new dashboards I've added to the app. Uh, one of them is a system check dashboard, so you'll get that question, hey, can you please let me know if Bob's computer is still running weird commands or whatnot? You've already remediated it. I want to know if it's still doing bad things. You can put Bob's computer name in there, look it up. It'll tell you everything about Bob's computer. Talk about that later. Uh, and then another dashboard, which is just our system inventory dashboard I generated. How about you, Jason? Are you at anything cool lately? <laughs> Not not uh, not as cool as this. So um, uh, basically, we've what we've done with the app is we've uh, and this will be in an up, uh, upcoming version uh, along with the changes that were just uh, that you just discussed. As soon as I get your pull request, um, the uh, we're, we're 
changing up how the setup page is uh, constructed. So we will, um, you know, one of the things that we heard from folks was it was hard to kind of see some of the integrations that we have with other products uh, as well as Splunk. Um, so in the Splunk app, we're going to try and find like if you're, you know, if you're already working with another product, say like a Palo Alto, you know, wildfire appliance or a, you know, certain threat intelligence feed or something, we will point you to some of the download links so that you can pull that same threat intelligence or those binary analysis features into uh, into carbon black response as well, right? Um, so that you can you can use that in both products in, in Splunk and in CV response. Um, but yeah, I mean overall, um, you know, one of the things that we really, um, you know, pride ourselves on is is the fact that we're we're very open and uh, and and work with open source, so that you know we realize we can't uh, come up with all the ideas ourselves, and uh, you know we have a very small team at Developer Relations. We can't we certainly can't implement them all ourselves, uh, and so we're super excited to work with the community and. Um, you know, we've had contributions both in the event forwarder as well as the uh, Splunk app from folks like folks like Mike, and uh, we've you know we regularly integrate them in with the product and in, into our connectors and so forth, so that everyone in the community can uh, take advantage of um, of all the cool stuff that's happening out there, right? Um, because it really, it, it you know, <laughs> not to take the not to take the idiom, but it's it's it takes a village, right? It takes all of us to uh, to defend our networks, right? And uh, if we can all work together, um, we're all going to be stronger for it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of the biggest things that I wish I had more time to do was contribute more safe searches. You know, we have 54 in here right now. I'd love for it to be a couple hundred, right? Just so everybody can contribute, add all kinds of new things that you're working on, and you know, we're all able to, you know, take this and, and help everybody as much people as we possibly can. And I think that's probably one of the coolest things about this app. You can use it with the API, without the API. If your Splunk license can't handle process and Metcon data, you can actually just send watch lists and feed alerts, or just alerts, those three things, um, to this app and you'll still be able to gain you know, a lot of data and a lot of help just from that. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a powerful tool. I, I really enjoy this app. Cool, hop on to our next one here for uh, alerts. Um, so I probably most everyone here has set up an alert in Splunk. <laughs> and, um, what I ended up taking was just our simple uh, PowerShell encoded command here. This is the alert one. Um, so all the different types of variations of encoded command that I could find. I dropped it into my standard method of how I want to get that alert. And then again, uh, to set up an alert, click on that save as alert button over here on the right. And then you'll be prompted, give it a name, anything else you would like within here. Um, and at the bottom, is where your trigger action will occur. So you're able to then now say, I want to send an email, and you know you can put any other information in here as well. Um, it's up to you if you want to attach it as a CSV or an inline table, right? It's a uh, very specific granular. However, you would like to get that data to yourself. Um, pretty neat. Pretty neat focus. Um, obviously, there's a lot of different apps out there now based on the adaptive response framework that allow you to. Um, do any type of action, in which we'll discuss that here in a second as well. Anything else to add on this guy here, Jason? It's pretty simple. No, nothing else. I mean, basically, um, it's the, the power of being able to search in Splunk. Um, you know, it's pretty powerful, um, and it's it's really the, the the great combination of getting all of the um, the very granular endpoint data from Carbon Black and getting it into uh, you know a tool like Splunk to be able to do that sort of powerful searching and visualization um, is, is great, especially if that's like your single pane of glass, right? If you're if you're used to working in Splunk, um, you can really combine the best of both products into into really an effective uh, tool. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, yeah, so I'm going to hop right into event scoring, and we got this idea from another group out there. They were, they had a dashboard that was able to, I think it might have been dynamic, could have been static, 
but they were doing scoring based on different types of events, and they had this for Windows logs, Carbon Black events, watch list feed hits, and whatnot. And so as these were trickling up, they were giving everything a score. Um, and so we've built a very basic generic method for us to do that as well. And so what, I, what we ended up building out here was we took watch lists, our feeds, and any indicators of compromise that were associated for endpoints. So endpoint name would be on the left-hand side. Um, this, is, this comes with the app today. Um, and again, if you're only sending watch lists and feed hits, this will work for you out of the box. Uh, if you're sending everything, you can tune this to work for your environment. And I'll show you a little bit more details here. Uh, and so on the right-hand side, after all this command line IOC data, you'll get a count and a risk score. And the way we generated that was very statically within, the, within this. So this is the search right here. This is in the app. It's under risky assets. Uh, and this is the risky assets over 70. Um, and so at the top, we're using our data model. Our, the Splunk app here comes with a data model built in. And we did that because we had 70,000 endpoints. They were all generating more than one event. And we wanted to quickly get through this information. Uh, and then it allowed us to perform that risk evaluation here. And so pretty generic risk scoring, right? So if the count of, of a certain endpoint, if they had 10 IOCs or more, uh, or three or five, or the count of this all started to rise up, they had an increase of plus 10 per each of these. So if an endpoint had over 40, they guaranteed had a risk of 40 in our environment. Um, and then for your own tuning, what you can end up doing is actually put in here feed equals virus total or your own custom internal feeds, whatever feed you might be using. You can give that its own specific risk score as well. Uh, if there's certain watch lists that you have that are higher fidelity than others, you can give it a 100 or a 15, whatever. Uh, we always felt that if a process was blocked in our environment, at the risk score of 100 because most likely it was something we blocked. We blocked it for a reason, whether it's ransomware or something else, right? Uh, so we wanted to learn on it right away. Uh, and as you can see, it kind of goes down the list here of the other feeds that are built into Carbon Black. Um, so then we sort them. We sorted by that feed count, watch list count, the IOC count. I just wanted to be able to sort that within, within this safe search uh, so that on the right-hand side over here, you can sort by count. I want to see the guy who has you know, 100 something uh, feed list feed hits, or the guy who has 100 watch list hits, or whatnot, and how, and you can sort that based on the risk as well. Uh, so the guy who has 100 plus is probably something going on in his endpoint, whether it was virus total triggering or alien vault IPs, whatever it may be. Um, you know, it just helped us to organize the amount of data we were shuffling through. Uh, very cool. It's built into the app, and it's probably one of the more powerful things that that is in there. Mm -hmm. And again, just uses the data model. This is great. I mean, I, I am not a uh, an avid Splunk person, so this is cool to see the um, you know how you can chain all this stuff together to build a really compelling query. So this is really cool for me. <laughs> I mean, it's not totally sexy, right? Like it, <laughs> it's a little very very much. <laughs> yeah, but it works. <laughs> Yep, yep, it works. I mean, it, it generates cool information, like on the first screenshot. You know, you're able to see what's happening on this endpoint, right? Uh, but yeah, it's it's cool. Cool workflow action and automation. Great. So, uh, so this is a feature that we added into our. Um, CV response app for Splunk uh, probably about a year and change ago um, and it was uh, timed uh, with the addition of the adaptive response feature in Splunk itself and so really this is uh, addressing the use case of you know hey I, I've got all this great scoring right that we just we just figured out uh, I can I can determine what my risky assets are pretty uh, pretty easily um, what I'd like to do is kind of take the next step, and if I have very high fidelity alerts, um, let's just go ahead and take some sort of action based on that, right? And so if you know, like based on a threat score of, you know, you've got a threat score of like 98 or something like that, and it's a combination of very high fidelity alerts uh, that generate that threat score for a particular endpoint, uh, let's go ahead and isolate that machine from the network immediately, let's say, so that we can do some uh, some live response actions or uh, you know, just make sure that there's no additional, 
you know, compromise that could be occurring as part of it. Um, and so what we've done with the CV response app is built in three different um, adaptive response actions. Uh, you can see them on the right hand side in the screenshot. Uh, you can, uh, as a result of a, of a search in, in, um, in Splunk, you can ban an MD5 hash across the enterprise. You can isolate a particular machine from the rest of the network, which means it cannot communicate with any other machines internally or externally except for the CB response server, which, um, which is useful because then you can get additional data off the endpoint, uh, take live response actions and so forth. Um, but, you know, again, you know, without that machine being able to communicate to the outside world or, or to any other internal machines. And finally, to kill a specific process on the sensor. So if you've got, um, you know, those, those process notifications coming in, uh, from CB response or even, you know, more granular um, event types coming in from CB response. Uh, if you key in on one of those and, and you find, uh, you know, something that is not uh, particularly welcome, then you can, you know, trigger an action to kill that offending process uh, straight from that endpoint. So, so very powerful things that you can do. Um, and again, it, it powers that orchestration sort of uh, use case uh, straight from within Splunk. And um, you know, I, again, I'm going to show my my relative ignorance on the uh, on the Splunk side. So so Mike can help explain a little bit about how you set up alerts on the left hand side there, and what some of those um, what some of those options mean. Yep. Yeah. No. No worries. <laughs> um, so yeah, probably one of the more important things that I'll highlight two things here. Um, the first one is your alert type, and Generally, we always set hours to run every hour or so, and we tried to stagger as many as we could just because we didn't want, you know, 50 of them to run at the top of the hour every hour. Um, and depending on, you know, if you have a really high fidelity one you want to be alerted on, you can set it to real time or set it to 15 minutes. And in our environment, with the amount of data that was flowing just, you know, from CB, we were putting in about 500 gigs a day, um, and plus all the other amounts of data that we're generating as well from Windows logs, firewalls. It's a lot of data, uh, plus all the other alerts. So uh, we did every hour, and you can stagger. If you want to do real time, totally can. Uh, maybe performance impact on your box. Um, so the thing here at the bottom I want to highlight is a throttle. We set throttles up on these, on all of our alerts, specifically so that if an endpoint was compromised and it was, you know, malware and it kept executing a certain command or you know, running PowerShell over and over. Um, we would throttle it on the computer name for two days or so, and depending on the alert, you can go longer. Uh, but it will more or less stop sending you the alerts uh, to your email or whatnot, and so you don't have to keep continuously receiving that data over and over. Um, so if it's a really noisy piece of malware running net or whatever, um, you don't want to keep getting hounded by it. We throttle it. That was one of the best ways we could suppress that type of data, uh, just so we didn't get inundated with more and more alerts in our ticketing system. That's awesome. And you can I know these. I've had that issue when I've been playing with this too, where I I set this up and and it keeps alerting on the same thing over and over and over again, and I'm like, you know, this this is great. This is great uh, feedback here. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> you learn quick, right, when you run into these kind of things? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Cool. <laughs> so the last one I think we have here is the software inventory. I feel, so, I feel super ashamed to show this dashboard. Um, but there's cool magic behind the scenes that's happening here, and I think that's probably the more interesting piece that I'll talk about. Um, so I created a software inventory. So at Red Canary, we do this thing that we call baselining. Uh, we use a tool for Carbon Black called uh, CV Response Surveyor. And so the way we use Surveyor is we create a definition file and we use the product, the tool, to query Carbon Black through the API to pull out what we want from that definition file. So definition file can be different scripting languages, Python, Perl, whatever, uh, any type of Active Directory tool, csvde.exe, um, DS add, you know, DC promo type thing, or it can be browser based. So show me, you know, Chrome, Firefox, whatnot. Um, and so probably the more interesting one is obviously the middle pie chart here. We have a definition file at Red Canary called the critical process check, and it pulls out what we consider 
what looks like critical processes. Um, so it's kind of looking for a little bit of everything that an actor or malware may be using on an endpoint. Uh, so, and I always add to this one because constantly it's being added, you know, like the PC Lua one earlier. Um, so those types of things are added to critical process. And so I was trying to figure out a way to add this into Splunk so that we could put this into our app. And what I ended up building was the sad little dashboard that's missing data because my demo environment's really boring. I don't have a, DC, a domain controller to do a DC promo on. Um, but what I did is I built a bunch of lookups. And this will come with my pull request, Jason. <laughs> and so each one of these lookups has what almost our definition files have here at Red Canary. Um, so Windows browsers, pretty self-explanatory, critical processes, similar to that pie chart, uh, file sharing and backup. This one's going to be people running Dropbox, .exe, Box, you know, different file sharing utilities. And so it looks for this data within our Splunk information that we're pulling in, and then we'll add it to your dashboard there. Um, so you kind of think about the searches for this dashboard. They're very generic. It's just running it against that lookup um, and pulling it back and adding it to the dashboard. Similar to scripting, this is where like Python or WScript, uh, PowerShell, I think is in there as well. And then security tools. The security one is going to be different AV products. Um, within our security definition file at Red Canary, I think we have like 30 different AV products in there, 20 or so. Um, so I added all those there. Anonymizers are specific to like Tor.exe, I2P, whatnot, pretty basic, and BitTorrent. Um, you know, looking for different Bitcoin clients that are running out there. So pretty simple way to do it. I thought this was a pretty a good way to do it versus doing a bunch of macros with a lot of just long queries and whatnot. Hope it's interesting. Um, have you messed with lookups, Jason? Have you checked them out before? No, not yet. Um, you know, this this looks really cool to to try and I mean, basically the the idea uh, at the end of the day is is you you have a lot of very granular data and you want to like essentially uh, you know pull it up a level, right? You you're kind of building an abstraction layer and saying like you know here's all the different you know underlying values that represent these higher level concepts and uh, being able to do that allows you to then think in that higher level and build really cool queries right that uh, you know you're no longer talking about specific IP addresses or MD5s or or process names you're thinking in terms of you know concepts and um, you know groups of processes talking to other groups of processes or other hosts and so forth right um, and so I think it's it's great uh, way to to provide those building blocks to people to, to build those more complicated Splunk queries on top of it. Yeah, totally. I agree. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a powerful tool. I mean, the two products together, right? I mean, that's, that's a gold mine. Absolutely, absolutely. Good stuff. Awesome. So, yeah, we'll uh, go ahead and open up the Q&A here. And um, I think I have a chat window somewhere. <laughs> if anybody has any questions, feel free to shoot them across. Oh, yes, here we go. I think I have a question bar. Perfect. Do you have any questions, Jason? <laughs> no, not yet. Not yet. Awesome. I don't see any coming through. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, so how long have you been uh, working with Splunk? Oh, man. Um, gosh, I remember Splunk 4. <laughs> um, so I guess it's been quite a while. We're on 7 now. <laughs> wow. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> So we've got, uh, that's, that is a long time. I, I don't know when that was released, but I feel like that was many years ago. Um, so we have a question <laughs> yeah. about, uh, does the Carbon Black Response app replace the Bit9 for Carbon Black app? So there's two, um, there's two, unfortunately there's two apps in the, uh, in the, in Splunk base, and that's, that's kind of a historical thing because uh, Splunk actually built the TA um, for for Carbon Black, and then we built our own app on top of it. 
Uh, so there's two apps. Uh, if you search for the Splunk add-on for Bit9 Carbon Black, uh, that is the Splunk built TA that you'll need for, uh, for, for CB response. And then you would also install, if you search for just CB response in, in, um, in, in Splunk base, you'll find the CB response app for Splunk. And that includes the dashboards, the save searches, the custom commands, all the stuff that you just saw visually here uh, from Mike and I. Um, that's the app, um, and it includes all that. But you need both. Um, the TA is used to uh, parse out all the raw data from CB response. And then the app is layered on top of it to do all the other you know, great stuff that we just looked at during the, uh, the webinar. Um, if you have CB response in the cloud and Splunk on-premise and want events forwarded to your on-premise Splunk server, let's see, uh, da, 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 what should a customer, so basically, yeah, so you, if you have CB response in the cloud and Splunk on-premise, you'd use that second uh, method for getting events pushed into your Splunk server you would have uh, support on the CV on the current black side, configure the event forwarder to push data to an S3 bucket, and then you would install the AWS app for um, on your Splunk server on premise, and that's going to connect to the bucket, grab the events, and, uh, and, and, and import them into your local Splunk server, and then of course you'd install the, you know, the Splunk app for, or the CV response app for Splunk, and the, um, and the Bit9 Carbon Black add-on for Splunk as well onto your on-premise um, Splunk server on your uh, on your local machines. So we talked a lot about response, right? Okay, so so great question. What about protection and defense? Uh, so we have Splunk apps for all three CB products. So CB uh, has a portfolio of products. We talked about response because it's a the, the basically the industry's leading EDR solution. We we have you know great visibility through response, and that powers some all of this uh, stuff in in Splunk. However, um, for protection and defense, um, protection has a a Splunk app available for it as well. So if you just search for CB protection in Splunk base, you'll find it. Um, let me just make sure it's called. Yep, CB protection app for Splunk is what it's called. And you can install that, and it will connect to your CB Protect server. Um, the Defense has a add-on, um, so the Defense app is just a way to get the CB Defense notifications and alerts into Splunk. We don't have any dashboards or anything for it yet, uh, but we will we will be uh, looking into that for for future revisions. Um, so if you just search for CB Defense in Splunk Base, you'll find the CB Defense add-on for Splunk in there as well. And um, so as far as, you know, middleware between Splunk and CB, so there's, um, we, we don't have any specific middleware uh, in between other than the um, event forwarder that we just described, right? Um, and we also, um, as far as using uh, CB's APIs separately from Splunk, um, we have a series of Python modules uh, called CB API. So if you uh, go to cbapi.readthedocs.org, um, you'll see the documentation for that Python module, and that Python module is used to power all of our integrations, including the Splunk integration, as well as all of our connectors with third-party products. Um, it allows you to um, call the APIs in, in any of the three products in a very similar way, um, take actions, do anything that the APIs allow you to do in a nice Pythonic interface. So um, if you're using Python, which again, my favorite language, um, and, and Carbon Black, I would encourage you to check that library out um, as it makes working with our APIs super, super simple. And it looks like one more. Um, a roadmap for dashboards in the Splunk app for overall situational awareness or management reporting. So we're always looking for new ways to do uh, or new use cases, right? Um, we don't have anything specifically in our roadmap. It sounds like Mike's got a couple things along those lines, uh, especially with the software inventory and so forth. 
Um, but those are those are the sorts of things that, you know, um, if you've got specific use cases in mind, we'll we'll definitely take them as um, as uh, suggestions for future enhancements. Um, and of course, we're always we're always excited to um, to accept pull requests as people, you know, scratch their own itch and find ways that you know that work for them, um, you know, and, and are willing to share it with others. We we always encourage that so that uh, everyone can take advantage of it. Uh, in the entire community, and I think Mike, you um, the next one is really about that that software inventory. Speaking of which, may I know what the types of scripts in the software inventory, um, like some sort of list of what's in there? Yeah, absolutely. I so if you actually run to the uh, the Carbon Black GitHub repo and click on their Splunk app there. Uh, for CB response, and if you look at the fork, you'll be able to see uh, M Haggis is one of the forks that are there, and you'll be able to see what I've been adding to it. So I just pushed all of those up today, and you'll see the new lookups within there. Um, and you'll probably, if you're watching the app, you'll see the pull request come through today as well, so you can see it. Excellent. Excellent. Hey, so the next question here, Jason, is is the Splunk index for Red Canary CB, is it index equals CB response, or what name will the index be, and what is the source type name? Do you want me to handle that one? I can take it. <laughs> um, sure. So generically, we don't force a index upon the app, um, so it's wherever you're putting the data, and if you have a specific index, you can certainly add that to the macro. And the source type by default comes from the TA, the technology add-on, which will be uh, bit9 colon carbon black colon JSON, JSON. And that's within the macro as well. So if you go edit the macro, you'll see what it looks like. And it looks like we've got another one about latency consideration for cloud and on-premise hybrid settings. So, so basically, you've got a either Splunk cloud and CB response on-prem, or vice versa, CB response in the cloud and Splunk uh, on-premise. So, no, there's no uh, there's no necessarily uh, latency issues there. Um, essentially, what we do is we use S3 as that kind of middle bucket uh, in order to um, in order to kind of cache the the events as they flow through um, and then of course the the API calls go back and forth um, but there's no there's no issues in terms of you know there's no need for real-time communication between the two um, you know that the latency as long you know is, is going to be um, you know, reasonable. Uh, it's it's not going to have any issues or impacts in terms of using the APIs. Uh, they'll be they'll work just fine, um, no matter how you have it configured there. As long as the network is working between the two, you're good to go. I'll get this last question. It's actually kind of cool. <laughs> um, so the question is, can you compare what you're doing to Dark Trace? And so the biggest difference about what we're doing with Carbon Black Response. We we're taking one product and a, a product that was meant for, you know, incident response, finding bad things. Uh, we're taking that and we're using it for multiple use cases, whether it's software inventory or IT asset management, uh, whatever it may be, right? We're looking at it and we're taking it and we're looking from all these different angles and we're working to put that back in to provide value uh, with a single tool versus you know, having to buy multiple tools, right? Um, network connections, for instance. We're able to take network connections and correlate that against any kind of feeds. If you have a bunch of feeds, you can correlate that against that. Um, so a great example of how Red Canary is using Carbon Black Response is, if you haven't looked at our website yet, uh, we actually built a proprietary engine that takes this information from the event bus, similar to how we're having you uh, within this series to drop it from the event forwarder. Take it, we put it into our engine, and we perform all of our behavioral analysis on top of that from there. Um, and so we actually correlate, for instance, net, network connections against Farsight. Uh, we're using Farsight to identify and look for recently registered domains out there. So if someone hits a recently registered domain, our analysts will give an alert for it, and then they can investigate and take it from there. Uh, similarly, any type of new bypass that comes out or new behaviors that are happening, 
our team here at Rick and Aries is constantly looking forward and evolving and continuously making sure we have coverage for all these new types of behaviors. Um, and so at my previous job, we were a team of two, two guys, 70,000 endpoints. We had Splunk, we had Carbon Black Response. Uh, we built our, you know, kind of got a glimpse of what we were doing inside Splunk here today. All of this information, Red Canary has taken it to the next level, operationalized it. Um, they actually are working around the clock to make sure monitoring is happening. Uh, we had alerts going off every hour. They have people looking at events right now, right? Every minute they're reviewing data that's coming through and taking it there, um, which is probably one of the biggest differences of keeping things in house versus kind of like an outsourced model. Um, you know, team of two to a whole organization that can handle this for us now. So that concludes, that, yeah, that looks to conclude all the questions here. Um, so yeah, feel free to subscribe to our Red Canary blog, check out the Red Canary website. If you happen to be going to Carbon Black Connect, which is coming up next week, Jason, it's crazy. Are you going to be there? No, unfortunately I'm not going to be there. I, I, uh, I won't be able to make it. So are, are you going there, Mike? Yeah, yeah, we'll be there. Oh, man. Jason, uh, what is it? Uh, Casey Smith and I, we're actually going to be speaking um, next week. <laughs> it's crazy. Great. Uh, but yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you for joining, and I appreciate it. Thank you all for attending as well, and I hope this was informative and everybody got something out of it. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. I look forward to that uh, that pull request. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully today. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks, guys, and thank Talk you, everyone. Talk to you later.